the transformation of the universities in the United States in the direction of political correctness, a lot of that has to be laid at the foot of Franz Boas. The Frankfurt School started in the 1920s in Germany. It was composed entirely of a group of Jewish intellectuals associated with the University of Frankfurt in Germany. They were certainly part of the intellectual left and seen that way in Germany. When Hitler came to power, he dissolved them. They came to the United States, most of them, and they pursued their studies in the United States. Now, when they came to the United States, they were confronted with a sort of empirical culture that was not so typical of Germany. Germany was more still in this sort of philosophical era. The intellectual life would have been dominated by people like Marx and Hegel and that sort of philosophical idealism or materialism in the case of Marx. And that, those were the, where the debates were. Because the, the English tradition, uh, you can see in American sociology, was much more empirical. You go out and you get numbers. So when they came to America, they really had a need to develop an empirical study. And so they became much more empirically oriented. And so, the, but their philosophical ideas were developed when they were still in Germany. They were very much informed by their political attitudes. And these people, as I say, were they were all Jews. They were deeply identified, strongly identified Jews. And once again, they were fundamentally concerned with anti-Semitism as a problem. And so they viewed their philosophy, and it really was a philosophy before it became an empirical study. It was a philosophy of anti-Semitism. And in that philosophy, they really used uh, fundamental psychoanalytic concepts. So they had the idea that anti-Semitism fundamentally comes from repressing nature. I mean, that's about as psychoanalytic as you can get. By repressing nature, you develop hatred to the Jews. And they even used you know, ideas like projection, which is very much of a psychoanalytic idea. In other words, Jew, uh, the idea would be that um, a non-Jew would uh, have a problem, say, in his economic uh, livelihood or something like that, or he would w want power for his own group. Well, he would, uh, th that is sort of morally questionable, and so he'd repress that and project that onto the Jews. So the Jews would be seen as lusting after power uh, and as oppressing Gentiles, when, in fact, uh, according to this theory, it was the, the Gentiles themselves who wanted power. And it was these, you know, wealthy Gentiles who would get these people to think that it was the Jews who were the problem when really they were oppressing the Jews and they were also oppressing, you know, the poor classes of non-Jews. So this was a theory. It was not based on any data. Once again, it was based on a sort of combination of Marxism and psychoanalysis. Um, no empirical data for this. But when they came to America, they, they, you know, they couldn't just sell this as a philosophy because in America you really had to get some data. Uh, psychoanalysis has managed to get by for decades without this, but I think the, Fr the Frankfurt School felt the need to sort of uh, get some kind of verification. So what they did when they got to this country was they started with the authoritarian personality studies. And again, they got at the very elite universities. They're associated with Columbia University, the University of California at Berkeley. And they came up with these questionnaires and so on uh, essentially designed to, to tap people's attitudes about Jews uh, and uh, try to show that, that these were a, a sign of pathology. So essentially what they did, uh, they, they uh, tried to show that people in the end with healthy family relationships, people who looked up to their mothers and fathers, people who had a strong religious orientation, um, that these people tended to have negative views about Jews and that essentially these negative views about Jews were a result of repression within the family, that they had hostility towards their parents, even though there's absolutely no evidence of this in any of the records that they had. They interpreted positive feelings for parents as sort of sublimations of hostility because in the records the the people who had strong family relationships had sort of fan, strong attitudes about their in-group and their family their nation their race these people tended to, to think uh, to have more negative views about Jews because after all Jews were an out group um, they, also, uh, they they interpreted these positive attitudes about their family as you know repressions of hostility towards their parents. And conversely, when they found uh, sort of surface feelings of 
anxiety about their parents, they interpreted those as signs of deep affection. And so the people that they were idealizing had sort of anxieties about whether their parents loved them. They had ambivalences about their sexual uh, identity and so on. Um, these are the people that the Frankfurt School were, were promulgating as the ideal liberal personality. The major obstacle was the family. The nuclear family, uh, with the father in the lead role, was extremely dangerous. Frankfurt School saw it as a repressive structure. So the nuclear family, w with uh, as, as a certain amount of restraint that's necessary for a family to function, w w was the place that uh, people learned uh, to be repressed. And they, they got conditioned to following orders. And this made them uh, into what uh, a later writer, Adorno, would spin into a book called the, the Authoritarian Personality. And the Authoritarian Personality was very bad. Uh, it, it conditioned us for a society where we would follow orders, hence you know, patriotism. So when the Kaiser called, Germans rallied to the cause. When the President of the United States called, or the Prime Minister of Britain, or the President of France, people, because of the nuclear family, were conditioned to respond to the father figure. Anyway, uh, uh, that all is really pretty simplistic, but th that's what they said. So it became very, very important to undermine the family. When I was a student at Johns Hopkins, I can recall in sociology and political science class, they did nothing but talk about this book published in 1950, The Authoritarian Personality. But, you know, they talked about it, they analyzed it, they criticized it, they talked about the methodologies and this and that. We actually had, there was a subject on my exams. But, you know, the weird thing was, they never assigned the book for us to read. <laughs> and, of course, it's only much later, you see, uh, when I was browsing a used bookstore, that I discovered the reason why they never assigned the book. Lo and behold, Right here on the introductory page, The Authoritarian Personality, copyright 1950 by the American Jewish Committee. This is ethnic politics. This isn't science. This is unbelievable. And, and so many of the problems now facing white Gentiles, which they may or may not, may not feel yet, arise out of this study and the prejudices, the bigoted positions that are set forth very candidly right in the introduction to the study. Let me read you a short passage which will illustrate the point. The present inquiry into the nature of the potentially fascistic individual began with anti-Semitism in the focus of attention. My, what a surprise, <laughs> given who's sponsoring the study. The authors in common with most social scientists hold the view that anti-Semitism is based largely upon factors in the subject. That is to say, in the anti-Semite. <laughs> and in his total situation, whatever that means, then upon actual characteristics, behavior, or power of Jews. Now that's really interesting. <laughs> that is to say, <laughs> The study of anti-Semitism is isolated in this project to characteristics of individuals they identify as authoritarian personalities. It never examines the relationship between that individual's interests and the practical and enormous exercise of Jewish power you see within the political system. It never examines the consequences and impact of Jewish power upon that individual and his reaction to it, you see? Because then the whole subject becomes much more nuanced and frankly far less prejudiced and far less bigoted. Uh, and, and, and here's another classic statement in the introduction to the authoritarian personality where they are discussing the methodology of all the studies in this thick tome. And they say here, <laughs> groups in which there was a preponderance of minority group members were avoided in the study. And when minority group members happened to belong to an organization which participated, pardon me, which cooperated in the study, their questionnaires were excluded from the calculations. 
What they're saying there is that, you see, prejudice and racism are uniquely white characteristics. This isn't science at all. It's simply ethnic warfare, and it is such blatant and obvious ethnic warfare, this book and everything it spawned. The authoritarian personality did become very influential, and it, it certainly does have uh, some data in it. It's not, you know, they, they, they were successful, you know, in um, impressing, I think, a lot of people. But even, even early on, when it first came out, there were, there were critics who looked at it and said, look, there's some, some weird stuff going on here. The, the reality was that they used psychoanalysis as a way of basically getting any, anything they wanted out of this. So there was some deception going on. I tried to, you know, I took special pains to show how, how counterintuitive these interpretations are, how lacking in scientific rigor. They have uh, uh, embarked upon uh, the promotion of a policy that, that is to deconstruct, or that is to tear down the major uh, foundations of Western society, the, the loyalty to the nuclear family, uh, loyalty to religion, to God, and, uh, lo and uh, loyalty to country. And, and in pursuit of doing that, uh, they play fast and loose with the facts. It's the th for them, it's the thought or the ide ideology that counts, not the empiric uh, justif uh, justification for, for conclusions. The Frankfurt School, at its base, developed the ideology that you had to sort of reject your family. By rejecting your family, you would then uh, be more likely to uh, accept, or you would be less likely to be anti-Jewish. And so, you know, it's a remarkable thing because they never supposed that Jewish children should reject their parents. If you're going to promulgate Judaism to the next generation, you have to have children who identify with their parents. But in the authoritarian personality, identifying with your parents, who were Christian especially, was the epitome of pathology. This had to be eradicated. Make us worthy of thy love. And we ask thee to bless the work of our hands and the people of this community. What you see with the, with the authoritarian personality is holding out individuals, radical individualism, as a cultural ideal. Now, of course, individualism is a long roots in, in European society. But what you're talking about with radical individualism is giving up all your allegiances. You just become the isolated individual. This is not a prescription that Jews have ever adopted. I mean, if there's anything that is characteristic of Judaism is a strong sense of identification with a group. So essentially this is a prescription for the behavior of, of Gentiles that would uh, essentially make them less likely to have allegiances with other groups. Because what, from the standpoint of Jews, what is the, the most terrifying thing is a, a group of non-Jews united by an ideology where they have a strong sense of group membership and which Jews are viewed negatively. I mean, the paradigm, and that would be, of course, National Socialism in Germany from 1933 to 1945. Fundamentally, what Nazism was about was having a strong sense of being a member of a nation, having a strong sense that you're part of an in-group, and these other people uh, are not, you know, you're, you're not on their page, uh, Jews especially. And so, uh, one way to get rid of that, basically, is to advocate individuals for everybody. Get rid of your allegiances. Don't have any, any allegiance to religion, country, race, even family. And again, one of the, the points I keep making there is that this is completely hypocritical because to be a strong identified Jew means that you are highly connected to a group, that you have a strong sense of group membership, that you think of outgroups as potentially threatening, as enemies, and so on. In other words, the psychological process of a group membership tend to make us view negatively the people in other groups, and, and, and that applies to Jews as well as anybody else. So strongly identified Jews tend to have strongly positive views of their in-group, strongly negative views of the outsiders. And, you know, that's part of the culture of critique, are these Jewish intellectuals have very negative views about the culture and peoples of the outside them.